It's time for Hall of Fame broadcaster Al Bernstein to interact with some of the most fascinating big name guests from the world of boxing and well beyond. Here's Al. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the show. We're glad you joined us. Our guest on this edition of Al Bernstein Unplugged is Nico Walsh, who happens to be the grandson of Muhammad Ali. Nico is following in his grandfather's footsteps, making his professional debut on a top rank boxing card on August 14th. He signed a promotional agreement with Top Rank, and we'll be chatting with Nico in just a moment. Uh, a mention of some of our future guests, uh, those of you that watch the show uh, and know that we interview uh, top personalities uh, in and about the sport of boxing and beyond it. Uh, and next, our next show, we'll have Leonard Ellerby, who is the head of Mayweather Promotions, Floyd Mayweather's company. He'll be giving us a lot of news on the Mayweather fighters, a little bit of news on Floyd Mayweather himself, and especially some news on Gervonta Davis, the uh man who has now won titles in three different weight divisions. Then, after him, uh, we'll have a show that I've been looking forward to with Rex Chapman, who is a former NBA player, and many of you know him as a star on Twitter. Uh, he has a fascinating life story, which we'll go into, and we're going to talk to him about uh, his celebrity now uh, as a Twitter influencer. So those are some of the shows coming up. We've got some other great shows coming up as well. But for now, let's concentrate on this week's guest, Nico Walsh, who is an amateur boxer, who is the son of Rashida Ali, Muhammad Ali's uh, daughter, one of his daughters. And Nico has been anxious to begin a professional career. Now he will be doing it. And he is a very interesting and insightful young man who wants more than to just be a good professional boxer. Here's my chat with Nico Walsh. Nico, you have uh, now started on a, what is going to be a fascinating journey for you, to be sure, uh, as a professional. And, you know, so much uh, for boxing fans and for the people that are, are watching you as, uh, as you head into your uh, debut as a professional boxer uh, are thinking about your family lineage. And uh, you, I know, have some really intriguing memories of your grandfather, Muhammad Ali, when you were just a youngster. Uh, it, it, it kind of became love at first sight at boxing with you, didn't it? Yeah, it did. I mean, everyone who knows about my grandfather knows that obviously I've been forced to be around boxing my whole life. Um, but it was love at first, type, at first sight. Once I picked up boxing gloves and I just started messing around, I, I pretty much fell in love with it. Yeah, and um, you became an amateur fighter, and you had about 30 amateur bouts. When you started doing it, did it feel like something that you thought was going to be more than just uh, something that uh, you did as a part-time, on a part-time basis? Well, for some reason, I knew when I started boxing, I I had to prepare for um, the the pressures behind it so i wanted to go all the way in so when i first started boxing i said i had some crazy dreams i dreams i want to be a champion i want to be a pro so i may have went too fast but my one of my grandfather's quotes is you can never dream big enough so but that's that's what it was i, I went into boxing and i just had these crazy dreams of i want to be like my grandfather i want to be like mike tyson and so now I'm here. Yeah, you. Now, did uh, did your grandfather encourage you when you were younger to do it? Yeah. So um, every time I was with him, when I actually started, um, I, I I had my first um, amateur fight, official amateur fight in 2015 when I was only 15 years old. But all the years before then, I would show my grandfather footage of me constantly when we were with each other it would be sparring footage of me or highlights of him so i wanted him in a way to tell me you shouldn't box because part <laughs> of it did scare me in terms of the legacy that i would have to carry on the pressures that would come yeah and mainly parkinson's disease i was afraid of as a little kid um because we don't we don't know what 
causes Parkinson's disease, but we know that boxing is definitely not going to help, especially if it's genetic. Right. So every time I wanted him to tell me no, he told me yes. So I said, should I keep boxing? He said, yes. I said, how about now? Should I keep boxing? And I kept asking him and he never told me no. So I had to keep going. You alluded to the, uh, the pressure, the idea that, you know, inevitably because of your family lineage, uh, people will look at you and say, well, is he, how good is he? And <clears throat> how much genetics did he inquire? Uh, uh, how have you, you're, you're a, a very, very intelligent young man. I know that from interacting with you and knowing your family and full disclosure, I am a family friend of the, your parents. Um, but, uh, how do you deal with the idea that there is going to be this extra pressure exerted on you? And have you already felt it even when you were doing the amateur boxing? Yeah, no, I've definitely already felt the pressures um, during amateur boxing. Honestly, as crazy as it sounds, I, I keep getting flooded with messages and people telling me these are huge shoes to fill um, with boxing. Everyone's saying how this is enormous pressure, this is, crazy this is crazy um but it's not the pressure in the ring that i'm referring to i know, know that just as my grandfather knew that boxing would build him a platform and boxing made him well known and he had you know you can know you can know my grandfather as being the boxer or as being the activist you right. know so when i say pressure i'm talking mainly what he did outside the ring you know, oh, okay. the pressures of being a human, you know, the kind of the kind of man he was as 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 a man. That's the pressure I'm referring to and inside the ring because he's just my grandfather. I I see obviously there being pressure, but I, I don't see the pressures being any different than if I was um, any other boxer. Every boxer experiences pressure, but the pressures that I'm more um, nervous, excited mm -hmm. about is the pressures that are going to come with with me trying to continue the legacy outside the ring and continue doing the things that he did outside the ring. Hmm. Do you, uh, let me ask you this because you're right at the beginning of this journey, but do you see boxing as a, as a, a platform to, to also be involved in other things? Do you see it as a platform to, Absolutely. for change? Yes. Yes. And my family, I mean, if you watched any of my grandfather's videos, you knew he was very religious, very spiritual. That's how I was raised by my mom, my dad, by, um, you know, my whole family, basically, that's just, that's my family. So that's how I am. And I don't look at boxing as just being boxing. I definitely see boxing as being a platform for me and I want to make change. Who doesn't want to change the world and make it a little bit better? That's that's what I'm looking to do at the end of the day. So I'm not I'm not just trying to have a, a great boxing career and my life be known as just boxing. Intriguing. You come from a family. I should let people understand that. You know, your nuclear family is a, a pretty extraordinary group. Your mom, Rashida, um, who, of course, is uh, Muhammad's daughter. Uh, she, you know, she is a entrepreneur, a public speaker, and has carved out a whole career for herself that's extraordinary. Your dad, a very, very successful restaurateur in Chicago, where you grew up on the south side of Chicago. My uh, former, uh, that's where I grew up as well, by the way, not too far from where you guys grew up. And, um, and your brother Biagio is a, a great young man who is a fantastic football player on both the uh, high school and collegiate level. So your family is a lot about achieving. Um, and, and it sounds like that seeped through to you, not only in terms of wanting to be a good boxer, but beyond that. Right. And you know, we, my family loves sports. My love, my family loves achieving, whether it be boxing or, or football or, you know, whatever it is, my family loves that. Uh, you said it perfectly. We love achieving, but mainly my family knows that this, whatever you are achieving is just at face value. It could, it could stand as a platform for what you, what you really want to do to make change for what you're really passionate about and 
that I think is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about boxing is because I know it can change my, my life and it could give me the ability to be able to maybe change other people's lives. Okay, so the first uh, part of this journey, you signed up with Top Rank Boxing, uh, Bob Arum's company, which interestingly is a company that did many of the um, the fights that uh, your grandfather was involved in. Uh, was that kind of part of the conscious decision to go with uh, Top Rank, a feeling that uh, there was a little synergy there? Yeah, no, synergy is the perfect word. That's exactly how it was. Um, I'm all about legacy. I'm all about tradition and family. So it would make, it was an obvious choice to obviously, I mean, it's been a dream to be with top rank mainly because of, I mean, they've been around for, you know, they have the best fighters today in my personal opinion, but mainly because Bob Arum, my, my grandfather was Bob Arum's first promoted fight ever. Right. So just the kind of, circle it's making in history with him promoting my grandfather and now promoting me it's it's crazy i love i love that narrative it's and it's part of the legacy it's part of the story so i love that you also have enlisted uh to help you one of the best trainers in the sport of boxing um sugar hill who uh, among many other fighters trains tyson fury the uh, heavyweight champion of the world, and uh, Sugar Hill has worked with a number of great fighters. And of course, he goes back to that uh, Kronk gym tradition. How long have you been working with him, and how did that come about? I would say I've been working for him maybe a month or, or so, but it feels like I've been working with him for years. I mean, we we talk a lot. Um, he's not just a trainer. He's a teacher. And a lot of people don't know that there's, there's a difference. It's and the difference is huge, but he is a teacher. And um, yeah, I just, I've learned so much in just the month that I've been training with him, but it, it ended up that my uncle, Mike Joyce knew Richard T. Sloan, which is the artist with affiliated with boxing and, yeah. and stuff. Uh, and my family knew him too. So Richard's been friends with sugar for, so many years, it just somehow linked up perfectly. I think it was just meant to happen. And uh, your uh, your debut is set for August 14th, <clears throat> your first professional fight. Uh, how do you, uh, how do you, when you think of how that it will go and when you think of what the emotions you'll be feeling uh, going into it, how do you envision that? I mean, I'm just every every time I hear August 14th now, I just get excited. Um, I, I mean, it's just the emotions are going to be excitement mainly. I think just getting started, my first pro fight, just that's a huge deal to me. That's just an accomplishment in itself. So I'm just I'm really excited for that day. You are uh, you're a student at UNLV, uh, majoring in business, I believe. And, yes. and and uh, and you're what about a year or so away from your degree? About about a year, maybe a year and a half. So you're going to be a professional boxer while you're going. To, I've known many boxers that have been in this position, uh, and uh, and it's not an easy task to juggle, um, you know, the, being a pro boxer with uh, being a student. Uh, does that? How do you? approach that and and how do you think that's going to work for you um my family including my grandfather i would say like especially my grandfather school has always been number one so i, I would used to send my report cards uh to them and uh <laughs> just get rewards for getting a's and stuff but that's the way it is with my parents school is always number one I don't, school is so tough, but I'm not one of those kids who bashes school or bashes college. I love school. I think it's really important. And um, I just, I have tremendous respect for whoever's a, a full-time athlete and student or a student who's working a job because it is, it is tough, but it's really important. And school is, is number one in, in my family's eyes. So I'm going to have to keep going with school. For people that have not, and most people have not seen you uh, fight as an amateur, certainly, what kind of fighter, uh, number one, what weight are you going to fight at? Mm -hmm. 
I'm well. I'm going to be fighting. I believe the first fight will be at 160. At 160. So you're going to start out at middleweight. Yeah. What kind of fighter are people going to see when they see uh, Nico Walsh in there? Honestly, I wish I could answer that. I mean, the way I fought in the amateurs is astronomically different from the way I've been fighting the last 30 days. With, with Interesting. Sugar. So I have no idea. I have no idea how I'm going to fight. I mean, uh, I know it's going to look great because Sugar's style is beautiful. If you watch Tyson Fury, you'll see that. If you watch any of his fighters, you'll see that. It's his footwork, his movement, his rhythm, the balance. It's like it's an art form almost. And so I don't know what kind of fighter you'll see. I'm actually asking myself that question, but I know <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be great. That's interesting. So you feel like you're evolving so much from where you were as an amateur that yeah. you're not sure where that destination stylistically is going to lead you. Definitely not. No, I'm just, I'm in the process right now of learning and improving. And the, I've dropped every bad habit that I've had in the past. And I've just said, sugar, just turn me into a new fighter. And that's exactly what he's doing. And so I, I'm excited to see the results. I see, I, I'm with myself every day, obviously. So I don't see the improvements, but he sends videos of me. He tapes the training and, and whatnot. So I'm able to see the big differences from the way I was before to just now. And it's only been a month. So along with the, um, the fact that, you know, so many people revered your, your grandfather and they will probably get a kick out of the idea of someone continuing on uh, who is a family member. Inevitably, in this day and age in our society, there are the negative folks who, who somehow twist things into a way that, like, you know, becomes negative in a way that you can't even imagine. Uh, how do you... And you're very, you're a, a mentally strong-minded person. How do you, it, without even anticipating what form that would take, how do you shield yourself from that idea? Somebody saying, "Oh, you know, you're doing this because you're Muhammad Ali's grandson, and you expect this favor and that favor." You know, you can imagine people uh, finding a negative spin to put on this. Of course, I mean, honestly, my first thought goes to. Am I going to experience more negativity than my grandfather did? And the quick answer is good absolutely point. not. No, very good. That's a that's a really interesting way to look at this problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I'm not going to experience a quarter of what he went through. Maybe not ten percent. So I I think I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, it's really interesting to look at from a historical standpoint and and uh and point that out and uh and and that will serve you well because clearly uh you know you're not going to to get that kind of uh negativity no, absolutely um, not when you look at this journey and you think of yourself uh as time goes on obviously a big goal for you is to become a world champion uh clearly i guess that's the the ultimate goal right mm -hmm. yeah no i mean that's been a dream when i was a little kid just you know a, a fantasy almost to be a world champion uh, boxer, just, yeah. So that's, I mean, that I would say that is the ultimate goal. Your brother Biagio, who is a wonderful football player and who has been kind of at the forefront uh, in terms of getting the attention as an athlete. And now it, in a way, while he's still a fine athlete and will continue to be, you kind of have your moment in the sun now more so because of the boxing. Uh, and, and that's an interesting dynamic as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is interesting because I'm, I'm not used to it, but, you know, I'm just doing me and I'm just, you know, I'm not here uh, for the gratitude and, you know, I'm here to just box. And if, if I could, if it was possible for me to box and continue the legacy without being known by anybody, then I, I would still be doing it. But it's, it's bigger to me knowing that it's it's for legacy and it's what my grandfather wanted me to do. It's what I love to do. So it's a lot bigger to me because of that. Well, hey, the best of luck to you. Uh, best wishes. I'm so glad I got to talk to you right here at the beginning of 
when you're just starting this out, uh, as I said, you know, said, I know your family quite well, and I've known you uh, and your brother and uh, and and your parents, and so I, I know where you're coming from as a human being, which is a, a very good place, and uh, and 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 it's a great addition to the sport of boxing. Thank you so much. It's an honor. All to right. be here. Thank you very much, Nico. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed uh, my chat with Nico Walsh. He is a fascinating young man, and uh, I've known him for quite a while uh, as a friend of Rashid Ali and her husband. And uh, I can tell you that he is a remarkable uh, young man, a good boxer, and we'll see how he progresses as a professional. Well, somebody who progressed really well as a professional, former amateur and professional star and world champion, Antonio Tarver. And, you know, we like to look back at some of the great moments we've had on this show. We've had some really great storytellers on. And here's a clip uh, of Antonio Tarver telling us how he came up with the famous line that he uttered to Roy Jones Jr. before their fight. You are known for many things in life, but one of the things that you're greatest know, that you're known for is the famous quote uh, <laughs> when you guys came to the center of the ring after you'd lost a very close decision, and you said to him, "Roy, what's your excuse this time?" Uh, uh, two questions about that: Did you? When did you plan that out, or was it spontaneous? I'm gonna give you another little nugget, Al. <laughs> Uh, at the time, I had a great friend of mine, Charles Muniz, who was working as my manager agent. Yeah. And, and in the hotel room, Charles Muniz brought that to my attention. And it, it kind of dared me to say it, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't know I was going to say it, Al, until I got in the ring at that time. But he made sure I remembered <laughs> that if I was going to say it, I better have said it then. And I don't know why I said it. It was just one of those things that I felt that at that's what the fight meant to me. Yeah. That whatever happened after we touch these gloves, you know, whether I get knocked out, whether he get knocked out, but, but we're going to go down in history. And I just felt that, Al. I, I just felt that it was going to be a special moment. I didn't know how it would end up. I knew that I trained to win. I trained to be successful that night. I actually trained to knock Roy Jones out because I didn't think I could win a decision. Yeah. And I think that edge, knowing I had to do more in that training camp, really pushed me, pushed me to places that I didn't even think I can reach. I think that every fan and every boxing observer was so taken with the audacity of what you did <laughs> at that moment. And the way you did it with such conviction, here's a question. Do you think it had – I mean, of course, Roy Jones Jr. is – one moment is not going to turn a fight. Define but his you career, think right. he was shocked that you did it? Um, he had to be a little bit, Yeah. I mean, taken aback. <laughs> I don't know how long it lasted on his mind. I don't know. The well, fight didn't last in, very long. Right, right. That wasn't my intention, yeah. but I just wanted to make a statement. And, and uh, I think the statement was made. That little nugget from uh, Antonio Tarver was something I did not know. And I worked with Antonio for a number of years when he was an analyst at Showtime. He never shared that one with me. But then when I interviewed him, uh, he did come up with it. That was a remarkable moment, to be sure. Well, one of the things we do on this show is answer your questions that you send to me at Al Bernstein on Twitter. Here's our first question. In honor of Chris Colbert's victory, what's the best restaurant bar owned by a boxer that you ever visited. Well, that is intriguing because there have been uh, a number of restaurants and or bars opened by boxers. Uh, Chris Colbert, who uh, is a fine 130 pound uh, fighter who is on the verge of potentially winning a championship, was featured on uh, our Showtime Boxing. And I talked about his restaurant, Primetime Chicken, which he has in New Jersey. Uh, and Brian Custer, our host, has been there, and he said the food's great. Uh, also, interestingly, Abner Mares, who is my uh, our color analyst on, and works with me on Showtime, has just opened a taco restaurant in Los Angeles. If I had to pick the, the best and most meaningful uh, restaurant bar ever owned 
by a boxer. It has to be Dempsey's, the great restaurant bar uh, that Jack Dempsey, the, the iconic heavyweight champion, owned in New York. Now, this uh, restaurant was opened in 1935, and it lasted all the way to 1974. And it was a hotspot for uh, boxers, entertainers, celebrities, and even political figures to stop by. When I was a young man, I think about 20 years old or so, uh, but around 1970, I took a trip to New York with a friend and I said, one of the places we have to go is Dempsey's. We went there and wouldn't you know it, when we were there, who comes waltzing in but Joe Frazier with a big entourage and he and Jack Dempsey, who was there at the place that night and we got to meet uh, and who often uh, welcomed people at his restaurant. He came up to Joe and gave him a big hug. And uh, it was, it was a, really a special moment. And uh, that was the kind of thing that happened all the time at Dempsey. So if I had to pick one place that was uh, the most iconic and the best, it would be Jack Dempsey's restaurant bar in New York. Here's our next question. What were, have been, the thoughts that you had on Richard Steele's call to stop the bout during the first Julio Cesar chavez Meldrick taylor fight with only two seconds left in the 12th round? The appropriate answer, I guess, should be that any time a referee feels a fighter is in danger or in trouble, they should stop the fight. And Richard Steele, who uh, had a brilliant Hall of Fame career as a referee, uh, certainly was a superb referee. Given that, however, I believe that some awareness of the fact that we were literally in the last few seconds of the fight, they had already clapped. At, with 10 seconds left, they, there's a clap that they do with uh, wooden uh, you know, boards. They clap it, and they let them know that it's the last 10 seconds of the round. So we knew that there were only seconds remaining. And yes, Meldrick Taylor was in trouble. Julio Cesar Chavez was all the way across the ring. And within that few seconds, probably could never, ever have even gotten to Meldrick Taylor. So my personal feeling is that the fight should have gone to its conclusion. And the interesting thing, of course, is just about everyone felt that Meldrick Taylor was going to win a decision. And in fact, had it gone to the scorecards, he would have won a decision in that fight. So I have to say that uh, from my standpoint, probably a fight that they should have let go those last few seconds. But there has been much debate over that, that's for sure. Well, I want to remind you that upcoming on uh, the show, we've got Leonard Ellaby as our next guest, uh, the head of Mayweather Promotions. Interesting man who has We'll be breaking lots of news for us about the Mayweather fighters and Gervonta Davis, uh, one of their main, uh, the main fighter in the Mayweather promotion stable. And then after that, Rex Chapman, a big star on Twitter now in the social media world, a fascinating and interesting guy. And I think he will make for a great conversation. We hope you'll join us then. Take care, everyone.